All right. Good morning. Welcome back to CS 125. So, it's our only lecture this week, or the only time we're going to be in Follinger because of Obama. Thanks, Obama. Um, but today we have some really important content to cover. So, up till this point, we've talked about several of the things that computers are good at. So, we've showed you how to store data using computers, using variables. We've showed you how to make simple decisions using both conditional expressions and conditional statements in Java. So now I can have my code do one thing or another thing based on some information or some data that's available to it as it's running. Today we're going to finish talking about the most important building blocks of imperative programming. And that's the last thing the computers are really good at, which is doing things over and over and over extremely quickly. And if anything, that is the defining feature of computers that makes them so different from us, is just the speed at which they can perform calculations. Your brain is an incredible feat of biology, but it will always be outraced by even a slow computer. And again, this is sort of like the fundamental property about computers that has given rise to the modern technological age. So the reason that Deep Blue was, be, it was able to beat Gary Kasparov at chess wasn't because Deep Blue is smarter than Gary Kasparov. It's because Deep Blue at the time, and this was like 20 years ago, maybe more, was able to extremely rapidly map out the game in front of it. All of the different moves and all the different responses to those moves and all of the different responses to the responses. And it was able to do that with incredible speed and precision, but really with incredible speed. So we could see much more of a potential in the game in the future. That's how computers got good at chess. How did computers get good at the game Go, which took a lot longer? AlphaGo, Google's Go playing computer, got good partly because it played itself. It trained itself to play the game Go. And it played itself over and over and over again extremely quickly. So when you learn something like how to program, which some of you are learning right now, or how to play an instrument or how to ride a bike, how to do anything, practice is critical. That's one of the reasons why we have daily homeworks in this class. That's one of the reasons why we have an MP out right now. Throughout the semester, we're going to ask you and encourage you to practice over and over again. And if some of you are feeling a little bit lost or a little bit freaked out right now, that's okay. You're gonna keep practicing. These basic building blocks we've been talking about for the first week are not going away. You're gonna see them over and over and over again throughout the rest of the semester. But again, how did AlphaGo get good at the game Go? It played itself over and over and over again. It got a huge amount of practice, way faster than you can. A master Go player might play, I don't know, a million games in their lifetime. AlphaGo could play a million games in like five minutes against itself. And every time it's playing, it's learning. You know, it's observing, okay, I tried this particular thing and that worked, so I'm gonna preserve a little bit of whatever strategical impulse caused me to do that into my model for how to play the game Go. And after I do that for days and weeks at a time, I'm able to play at a level where I can defeat even experts at the game. So this is, again, what we're gonna start talking about today is really something that seems simple, but it's the foundation of how computers are changing our lives, that it's this ability to do things over and over and over again, incredibly quickly, with speed that you don't really even be begin to comprehend. So the programming construct for having a computer do that is something called a loop. Here's our first example of a loop. This is another statement, type of statement in Java, similar to the if-else statements. You'll see again, we see a block. But a looping construct isn't a decision-making statement, it's a statement that indicates that the computer should repeat a particular set of steps over and over and over again until something causes it to stop. So this is the simplest possible loop that we could write in Java. It's called, this is a type of loop that's called a while loop. And again, these, these uh, choices of these words are not designed to confuse you. They're designed to indicate what this does. So while a particular condition is true, do something. In this case, while true, so when is that condition going to be false? Never, right. So while true is always going to be true, I'm going to 
The computer is going to run the statements that are inside the block, and then when it's done, it's going to run them again, repeat them again and again and again. So let's talk about while loops. We'll talk about two styles of loop today, and then we're going to talk a little bit about why we're doing, we're using loops, the loop's best friend, a data structure called an array. So a while loop has two components. It has a condition and a block of code to repeat. So while that condition is true, it repeats the block of code. As soon as the condition stops being true, I stop repeating the block of code. If the condition is never true, then I will never run the block of code. So when I arrive at a while statement, I examine the condition. If the condition is true, I execute the block, then I re-examine the condition. If the condition is still true, I execute the block again, and then I re-examine the condition. I continue to do this until the condition is false, at which point I stop, I drop out of the while loop, and I continue executing whatever statements or code are below it, okay? But again, if the condition is false, the while loop will never be executed. That's important to understand. So if I come to a while loop, and the first time that the computer looks at the condition it's false, then none of the code inside the block will ever be executed. Okay, so here's an example in our little playground. On line one, I'm initializing a variable of type int, and I'm setting that to zero. Index is a commonly used variable name whenever I'm looping. It indicates what iteration of the loop is being executed. And then I have this while statement. And the while statement says, while the ver value of index is less than four. And then I have a block. So the block, you can see again, are curly braces. I open the block on line two and I close it on line four, on line five, excuse me. The block contains two statements, one on line three, one on line four, and those constitute the code that's going to be repeated every time the condition is true. So what's going to happen inside that block? I've got a print statement that's going to print the current value of index, and then I have an update statement to the value of index itself. So I'm gonna increment the value of index. T two statements. At some point, index, because every time I go through the loop, I'm incrementing index, its value is going to go up, at some point, it's going to be equal to, at what point is this gonna stop executing? It's another way to think about it. At what point will the condition be false? What point will index no longer be less than four? Once index becomes four, so index is gonna start at zero, then I'm gonna get incremented to one, to two, to three. Finally, once it gets to four, I'm gonna hit the top of that statement. I'm gonna check it against four. It's not gonna be less than four anymore and the statement will stop, this, this block will stop executing, the loop will exit. And then, what's gonna happen, I'm gonna continue with the statement on line six. So I'm gonna repeat the statements on line three and four, I'm gonna repeat that loop block until index is equal to four, and then I'm gonna print done. So when you're starting out developing an intuition about how Java code works, what we just did is something that I would encourage you to do. Take an example, think about it first. Think it through, don't run it, it's cheating. Think about it first, convince yourself what's going to happen here. What should I expect to happen? Once you've walked through it and you think you have an expectation of what's gonna happen, then run it and see if you were correct. So we said that the loop would stop executing once index got to four, and it looks like that's the case because the first time through the loop I print index, which is zero, the second time I print one, the third time I print two, the fourth time I print three, I'm starting from zero. This is zero-based indexing, which is important to us as a computer scientist, and then I print done. So you can see that that block inside the loop has been executed four times. First time it printed zero, the last time it printed three. Okay. So now that we've acquired, so now we can, you know, again, I, I said this was incredibly powerful, and it is. So now you can get a computer the fastest logical creature on Earth to repeat something for you potentially thousands, millions, billions of times. If I ran that little loop on, you know, a fast machine, I could execute, you know, potentially trillions of that calculation per second. It's incredible, but I do want, usually want it to stop at some point. And so, and now you guys will have this problem. This is one of those bugs that I almost guarantee, I think people have already had this problem working on MP0. 
He will write your code, he'll run it, he'll stare at it for a minute, and then there'll be some sort of error that's generated. And the reason is that you have a loop, Java started executing the loop, and it did what, it did exactly what you told it to do, except you forgot to ensure that the loop terminated. It stopped. At some point, I'm done. So, what about this one? Very similar, again, this is a kind of mistake that's very easy to make. Very similar to the loop I used before. I have a value called index that I initialize on line one, of type int, I set it to zero. Then I'm gonna continue this loop while index is less than four. I print the value of index, I decrement it. What's wrong with this? Right, I have not made any changes to this variable that are gonna cause it to fall below four. It's starting at zero, and then I decrement it to negative one, negative two, negative three, so I'm going farther and farther away from the condition that's gonna cause this loop to stop. And you'll see if I try to execute this, what's gonna happen on our playground is it's gonna tell you there was a timeout. Because our little server that ran this code started running your code, and at some point it was like, you know what, I'm pretty convinced that good stuff is not happening here. So I'm just gonna shut this down, and I'm gonna give you this error. This is an unterminated loop. It's actually much easier than that to write an unterminated loop. So here's an example. This is the canonical example of an unterminated loop. While true. So remember, the while loop tests its condition every time before it executes the block. So if my condition is literally true, then this loop will never terminate because the condition is false. Now in a minute, I'm gonna show you a couple of other ways to terminate a loop. So you will see loops like this in code. That doesn't mean they're wrong. However, every time I write, I, I don't write one of these often, but when I do, I get a little shiver, you know? I check myself for a minute, I say, am I convinced that this is going to exit. Because if I'm not, and if the body of the loop, if the code inside the block never forcefully exits the loop showing, using some techniques I'm about to show you, then this will run forever. And at some point, something will go wrong. Because I'm repeating this calculation endlessly. So again, if I run this, it's gonna get the same timeout, timeout one. One thing I want to point out is that when we're in lecture and we're doing these little examples, you guys should be running these at, at, at your seat. You know, as we're going, you know, you're also welcome to edit them, make some changes, make sure that, you know, things are lining up with your intuition. So, let's look at cases where the loop never executes. So let me modify this a little bit. So in this case, how many times am I gonna print here? Zero. Remember the condition gets executed every single time before I run the block of code. So here what happens is Java gets to line two. It says, okay, this is a while loop. Let me see if the condition is true. The condition is false. It says, okay, I'm done. I'm just gonna move on. So if I run this, yeah, so there's no output, right? Questions about while loops before we go on and talk about other loops? So this pattern is very common. Frequently in your code, you wanna repeat some action some number of times. There's algorithms, which we're gonna start talking about next time, that involve, you know, repeating a particular step in the computation over and over again until, you know, I've processed all the data or I've calculated the answer that I was looking for or, you know, I've repeated it a certain number of times. And so, you know, this type of thing where I, I create a counter this is a, this is a variable that's a, that's serving as a counter. Sometimes we call, you can use the name counter for these counter variables. You can also call them index. Sometimes we call them i. These are common names. Don't call them like foo or something because that'll confuse people that are reading your code. This is an example of a time, a, a time where we can pick good variable names and when there's conventions about what variable names to pick. So don't make up your own words for counter variables. Just use the ones that we already have. So index is a good one. So in this case, I'm going to initialize index to zero, and then while index is less than four, we just sort of did this, I'm printing the value, I'm, I'm repeating some step, 
And then at the bottom here, you can see on line four, after I've executed all the statements in my while loop, I increment index. So one of the reasons why this is such a common pattern is this block of code will execute exactly four times, and four is the literal that you can see on line two. And so this is so common that we actually, oop, there's a little bit of a description here that I just walked through. This has its own special syntax in Java and pretty much every other programming language. It's called a for loop. For loop does something for a specific, usually for a specific number of times. That's the common way to use a for loop. So compared with a while loop, the for loop syntax is a little bit more complicated. So let's walk through it together. There are three parts to a for, well, let me get a little bit ahead before we. All right, here we go. Hold on a sec, where did that go? I'm missing a slide on this, okay. Let's just look at it. Okay, so let's look at this together. There are three parts to the for loop. On line one, you can see there's a first part where I declare and initialize a variable. So this is the first time I've seen this happen that's not sort of on its own line, right? So on line one, I say for int index equals zero, so I've declared a variable called index. Now, one thing that's important to note is that this variable is only available inside this block. So I can't access it after the for loop terminates. So I create a variable called index. The next part of the syntax, these are separated by semicolons, is what we call the check. So this is, this condition is checked before the for loop begins executing. So this is sort of like the condition for a while loop. Every time before I execute the loop, I'm gonna check this condition. And then the last part, Again, three parts separated by semicolons, is an update statement. So that is run every time before I begin a new execution of the loop. So the initialization, the first part is run once when I enter the loop. The condition is checked every time before I repeat the loop, and the update statement is run after I finish each execution of the block. It is not run the first time. That's important. So I initialize index to zero, and then after every execution of the block, I increment its value. I also perform the update before I check the condition. So again, we'll walk through every step of this together. But first, let's get some practice doing this. So let's take this while loop, and let's rewrite it using a for loop. And you can see that when I'm doing a canonical loop like this, for loop syntax is much nicer. So I'm gonna remove the while, I'm gonna change this to be, you guys should be following along, change this to be a for. I'm gonna move the initialization inside the for loop, and I'm gonna move, oops, this is not called i, it's called index. So you can see I can get rid of the initialization that was on line two, I can get rid of the update statement that was on line five, and what I'm left with is a loop that has identical semantics, but much cleaner. Okay. So let's write this one. We, we, so we don't have to start at zero. So here's an example where I'm gonna start at two. So let's say, again, I'm gonna move the initialization inside the for loop, and then I'm moving that update statement inside the for loop. How many A's are gonna be printed here? Let's think about this. So what's the value of index the, well, let me remove this additional statement down here. What's the value of index the first time that line three executes? Two. What about the next time? Three. So that's two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is it gonna execute with a value of eight? No, because at that point, the condition will not be true anymore. It's not less than eight. So I count two, three, four, five, six, seven, six times. Oop, okay. Oh, I forgot to make one important change. Uh, oh, right. Ah, that's why this is here. 
What's wrong with this? Yeah. Yes. So remember our scoping rules. And remember what I just told you. When I change a while loop to a for loop, this is one of the things that changes. And sometimes this is a reason not to use a for loop. So index is only available inside the block. So if I comment this line out here at the bottom, then I can see that I'm printing 6a. Why are they all on the same line? This is weird. It looks like what I normally do, yeah. Yeah, this is print, not print lin. So in Java, print lin prints the string you give it plus a new line. So it will advance to the next line. Print does not. So now I see six A's on new lines. So if I want to access the loop variable outside of the loop, I can either use a while loop like I did before, or I can do this. And this is a variant of a for loop. So each part of the for loop is actually optional. So I don't have to initialize a variable. I don't have to check the variable against everything. And I don't have to have an update statement. <sighs> oh. Yeah, I know. There we go. So now this works. So I see six A's, which is the number of times I expect the loop to execute. And then I'm printing off the value that caused the loop to terminate at the bottom, and that's eight. Okay, good. So you're gonna see, I don't know, I mean, I, I should actually run an experiment. I should analyze some code out there on the internet to actually answer this question. I bet you can find this. I bet if you Google around a little bit, you can find someone who has done an analysis of, you know, publicly available source code and can tell you what percent of loops in the world are for loops versus while loops. I suspect it's about 80-20. 80% for loops, 20% while loops. For loops are more common because this is a really common idiom, repeating something a certain number of times. So you're gonna see a lot of these for loops. You're gonna write them, you're gonna read them. Here's the things to keep in mind when you're looking at them. So the initialization step, that's the first part of the for loop declaration that happens once and only once when I reach the for loop. The conditional is evaluated every time before I start the block, including the first time. So this is similar to a while loop. If the condition is false, the first time I execute the for loop, it will not execute. So let's go back. We can convince ourselves of that using this. So let's start with index of eight. No A's. Right? When the for loop executed, it said is index less than eight? Nope. So I'm never, I'm, I'm never executing the block. Finally, the update is performed at the end after I execute the block. So initialize once, check the condition, enter the block, go back to the top, update my variable, or perform the update statement, which can really be anything, and then check the condition again before I enter the block. So written down step by step. So I check the condition, I initialize the loop variable, that happens once, then I check the condition, the condition is false, I'm done. The condition is true, execute the block, then perform the update statement on the loop variable. Then I go back to number one and check the condition again. The condition is true, run the block again. Okay, good. So, let's look at a slightly more complicated example. You will see things like this in the wild, it's not that common. The most common place for like weird loop statements like this is on quizzes in introductory programming classes. You don't actually see very many of these in the wild, right? But I can do stuff like this. So in this case, I've got um, a loop variable. What do I initialize it to? It's called loop. Initialize it to four. What's the condition I'm checking? It's less than or equal to eight. And then how am I updating it? I'm adding two. Okay, so how many times is this gonna execute? What's the value of counter gonna be after I finish running it? Don't yell it out, just think it. Think it through. Okay, now let's perform the experiment. How many people were right? Good. So what are the values of loop inside the variable? I start, I get four. 
Next time it runs, I get six. Next time it runs, I get eight, because it's less than or equal to eight. So the first time through the loop counter goes from zero to one, the second time through the loop counter goes from one to two, the third time through the loop counter goes from two to three, and I'm done. Okay, again, you won't see things like this very often. Normally this would be written using um, syntax. How about, how about this one? Okay, same thing. Take 15 seconds, look at this loop. Again, stuff like this. Don't, you know, don't write this loop. Um, but you should know how to understand what it does. Okay? Think to yourself, what's count gonna be? Four. All right, why? First time through the loop, i is 10. Is it greater than or equal to zero? Yes. What do I do to it? Subtract three. Second time, it's seven. Greater than or equal to zero? Yes. What do I do to it? Subtract three. Third time, four. Fourth time, one. Fifth time, negative two, not greater than or equal to zero, I'm done. So again, my count, which started at zero, has now been incremented four times and ends up being four. All right, last one. Take a look, think it through, execute it in your mind. So counter has, for i, has never been incremented here. Why? Because I initialized j to two, but the loop is only gonna execute if it's greater than or equal to four. So in this case, the loop body is never executed. Condition was false the first time the loop ran. Now again, this is really weird. This is super uncommon, because why would you initialize your loop variable to a value that's gonna cause the loop never to execute? All right, so I feel obligated to point out before we move on that you will see, again, cases where people have omitted one, two, or sometimes all three of the parts of the for loop. So I don't have to initialize a variable, I don't have to check a condition, and I don't have to update anything. Sometimes that's because the condition gets checked inside the loop, sometimes it's because the update gets happened in some complicated way inside the loop, uh, sometimes it's because somebody just hasn't learned how to program and doesn't know what a while loop is. So this loop down here at the bottom, what is that equivalent to? It's a while true loop. There's no check, and there's no update, and so the check will never be, if, if there's no check, the for loop will continue to execute. Okay. So and when you're starting out, particularly if you haven't programmed before, it can be helpful to write your for loop, write a while loop, and then try rewriting it as a for loop, and then try rewriting the for loop again as a while loop. Right, getting used to being able to map back and forth between these two constructs. Okay. Now that we've learned how to get computers to do something multiple times, one of the things we need to be able to do is control that. So a for loop is one way of doing that. Both for loops and while loops allow us to include a condition that causes the loop to stop executing. But I can also cause the loop to stop executing inside the block. And this is quite common. Sometimes the reason that you want to stop is really sort of complicated. And so it's not something that you can express inside the while loop statement. It might depend on some other piece of information. So for example, let's say you're retrieving data from a user. And you know, you'll see this in some of our, uh, the code that we give you for the MP. All right, I want to, you know, you're gonna enter a bunch of variables, and then the way that you cause the loop to stop is by entering a blank line or something like that, right? So that's something I want to be able to check inside the loop, not in the condition. So there's two looping statements that I can use to determine whether or not, and these control the execution of the loop. So the first one is called break. If you include a break statement in your loop, it will immediately stop. It's done. Nothing else happens. I just jump out to the bottom of the block and keep going, okay? The update, there's no uh, update to the variable that's done, I don't go back to the top of the loop, I immediately jump out of the loop, right? The next one, which is less common, is called continue. And continue doesn't exit the loop. What continue does is it immediately jumps back to the top. So I can have a continue in the middle of the loop that rather than continuing to execute the statements, continues the loop, so it's a little confusing. I go back to the top of the loop, and if it's a for loop, I'm gonna update the variable, check the condition. If it's a while loop, I'm just gonna check the condition, and then I'm gonna execute from the top. So it sort of jumps back to the top of the block. So here's an example. 
I've got a for loop here. What's the maximum number of times that this for loop will run? I've got an int i, I'm checking it less than 64. So how many, what's, what's the maximum number of times this for loop will execute? If there, if I didn't know anything about what was inside of it. 64, because I'm gonna start with zero, I increment i every time. This is one of those things that your brain has to start to learn to recognize, because this is by far the most common for loop. I start with initializing something to zero, I check whether it's less than a value, and I increment it every time. That for loop will execute at most whatever the value of that literal is. In this case, it's 64. But what's actually going to happen here when I execute this loop? Again, let's talk through it, and then we'll run it to make sure that, um, our intuition is correct. So, the first time I get to line three, what's the value of i? First time I run the loop, I just initialized i to zero. Have I updated it yet? No, because I've only, haven't, I haven't run the block yet. First time I get to the top, i is zero. What's the value of search? Eight. Is i equal to search? Nope. So I'm gonna print line seven. So n now we are seeing an example of combining a loop with conditional logic. So if i is not equal to search, I jump to line seven, I print not found, and I go back to the top of the loop. So what's, the next time, what's the value of i? One, is i equal to eight? Nope, so I don't execute that block of code, I go to line seven, I continue this until when? When is something different gonna happen? When i is equal to eight. So when i is equal to eight, now I'm going to execute the code inside this if statement. And what does that code do? It prints found, and then it uses the break keyword, uses the break statement. Now break breaks out of the innermost enclosing loop. It does not break out of an if statement. So break is gonna say, okay, I'm inside a loop. that started on line two, I'm done. And so I'm gonna jump down and execute. I'm, I'm finished. Yes, up in the balcony. Nope, the break breaks out of the enclosing loop. So whatever the, yeah, it's a great question, right? So if I have two for loops, let's say I have, and, and you guys will write nested for loops, particularly when you're working with um, image data on one of our MPs, because there's two dimensions to an image. So you have a loop that's walking through all the values in the image, it walks through, you know, the X values, and then it's an inner loop that walks through the Y values. So you're sort of going through like this. The break statement breaks out of the innermost loop. So it looks up, looks to the left, it says, what's the for loop that I'm inside? It breaks out of that one. If you wanna break all the way out, you have to work a little harder to do that. And ask that on the forum and we can show you how to do that. Yeah. Oh, let's run it actually to find out what happened. Yeah, so I print not found and I'm gonna print not found eight times, zero through seven. And then when I is equal to eight, I'm gonna print found. Let me include the value of I here, so you guys can see what's happening. Right, so when I is zero, I haven't found it yet. When I is one, I haven't found it yet. Finally, when I gets to eight, I break out of the loop. I print found, and then you can see that the loop terminates. Okay, questions about this? All right, awesome. Okay, continue. So let me give you an example of continue. Here's a loop that has a continue statement in it. Again, this is not as common, so I'm not gonna dwell on this. Um, so on line two, I print going, and then if I, if I is greater than or equal to two, on line three, I execute a continue statement. What happens at that point? Where do I go? Back to the top of the loop. So I go back to the top of the for loop, I increment I, and then I run the line on, I run the code on line two again. All right? So as you can see, what happens the first time through the loop, i is not greater than or equal to two, so I print both going in here. Second time through the loop, i is one, it's still not greater than or equal to two, so I print both statements. Once i becomes two, it is equal to two, so I execute the continue statement, I go back to the top of the loop, and I repeat, um, I can continue repeating. Okay. All right. So right, so, so there is, there, there is another way to do this, and you'll see both. So in the previous example, what I used to avoid executing the block 
the, the line of code on line six was I used a continue statement. But this isn't a great use of it because if someone's trying to read your code, this is a little confusing. Imagine I have a loop that has like 50 lines of code in it, and on line four, there's a continue statement. So somebody might be trying to debug it looking at the bottom and trying to figure out why isn't this executing? And then they realize, oh, there's a continue way up there at the top. This is something, this is another way to accomplish the same thing. So here, what I'm doing is I'm saying, if a particular condition is true, do something. This is actually going to produce the same output. Right, so I can see, I don't know why I'm producing this output, but I'm doing it for the purpose of this example. And this is sometimes considered more clear. Okay, and put wrapping this inside an if statement. All right, questions about loops? Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah, so the question about break. Is it this guy? Yeah, so, no, hold on, you, if loop. If's not a loop. Bingo. It breaks out of the innermost loop. If it's not a loop, if it is a conditional expression, right? There's no breaking out of an if. Break out of a loop. Yeah, it's a great question, and this is something that will c confuse you until you get used to it, which you will. Yeah. It will break out of a while loop, yep. It will also break out of a do while loop, which I didn't show you because they're a little strange. Um, any loop. Java has three loops. Four loops, by far the most common. While loops, also useful. And then there's something called a do while loop, which I will leave as an exercise to the reader. It's not, not particularly common. All right. So we've got 10 minutes left, and first time in this class we're gonna talk about a data structure. That's super exciting. Until now we've been building up these basic imperative programming uh, building blocks, but now, I mean, one of the reasons that we use computers is because they can deal with data. And because we've just talked about loops, it's time to talk about the data structure that really is a loop's best friend. What are we looping over? In these stupid examples we've been doing, these are all these little canned things that are just done to kind of help you develop intuition. But why would we want to repeat a step multiple times? Frequently the answer is, we're processing some piece of data, and we want to process every part of the data. So now you're thinking, okay, well, he showed us variables, and variables that can store numbers like an int or a float, we haven't seen something that can store more than one piece of data. So this is the first time we're gonna look at this. There's a limit to what you can do with a single value, right? How do you represent an image with one number, right? Um, how do you represent, you know, uh, the, the, the progress that everybody has made in this class until this point with one number? It's hard to do. A lot of times you wanna represent things um, that require, sorry, require multiple values. And this is surprisingly powerful. We're in week one of the class, basically. Last week was week zero. But this is one of those things that is really going, you know, arrays are simple, but they are incredibly powerful because they allow us to represent lots of different types of data. So give me some examples. Or, or th think a little bit about some things that could be represented not by a single value, but what if you could use multiple values? So now we can start to represent things like text. So what's a single value in a piece of text? What do we call that in Java? It's called a car, character. But text, speech, you know, the, you know, one of the sort of foundational properties of humans is our ability to communicate. That's one of the things that's special about us is all the, you know, the, the, the text that we've created in the world. So now computers can work with that. And actually, if you look at the kind of, uh, some of the work that's being done in the humanities today is being enabled by the fact that we're digitizing text. So you might have heard about the Google Books project. There's other, you know, people that are doing this as well, making a move to take data that for now has been just sitting on a piece of paper and put it into a format where a computer can now use it. So digitizing all of this textual data, all this paper-based data, is actually having a huge impact on these fields because now I can run computer algorithms on it. So I can look at things like 
you know, a particular word. When was the first time that word started to be used in books, right, in text? When did it be part, become part of the language? Now I can do this because computers have access to da this data, right, that data that's sitting in libraries and dusty corners now is being digitized not only because it's safer, but because computers can use it. So text, surprisingly powerful stuff. DNA. Again, a DNA is a series of values. It's a very limited alphabet, but this is, you know, the building blocks of life. This is why we sequence the human genome, because now computers can use it. They can process it. It's data. Stuff goes from being an artifact to data. T any sort of time series data. You know, a series of measurements made of something over a period of time. That constitutes a single sequence of data points. And there's a lot of time series data, include, including this piece of time series data that's incredibly important to me, and maybe to some of you as well, music. Music is a series of values. So a computer music is data. It's a series of measurements of pressure, of, of the pressure in the air at a particular point in time. That's what it is. I know it can move us, I know it has emotional qualities, and we can find it beautiful, and there's, you know, nostalgia associated with it, but fundamentally it's just a series of data points. And you guys will actually work a little bit with sound on one of our labs. Okay. So in Java, we store data like this using a data structure called an array. An array allows us to store zero, not very useful, or more, useful, values of, a, of the same type. That's an important restriction in Java. If I have an array of type int, every value in that array is an int. If I have an array of type float, every value in that array is of type float, or double characters, whatever. Okay? So arrays are our first example of a data structure. And like I said, you're, you know, some of you are going to want to take a, a course about data structures, where they're going to talk about fancy data structures with all these cool properties. But the fact is, you can get a lot of a mileage out of just arrays. They, arrays do a lot of heavy lifting in the world. When we talk about data structures, that term is instructive. Data structures bring structure to data. It takes data that would just be a jumble of you know, values all over the place, and imposes some kind of structure on it. Arrays put values in order. They bring order to data. So a bunch of data points, a bunch of ints just sort of floating around in the universe, in order to put them into array, I have to decide what order they go in. And again, this is incredibly important. If you take all of the values from the human genome and just jumble them around in any order, you don't have the human genome anymore. You just have a mess. What's important about structured time series data is the order. Same thing with music. If I just take all the values from a particular song and mix them up in any, any order, what I'm gonna have is static. The order is important. The order is what's meaningful. Not just the data values, but their relationship in the array to each other. Which one's, you know, later in the array, which one's earlier in the array. When I start to talk about data structures, frequently what they're doing is they're associating new data with the data inside them. So an array contains the values that are inside of it, but it also associates a new piece of data. Sometimes we'll call this metadata. It's data about data. It associates a new piece of data with the values in the array. That new piece is their index. It's the location in the array. So again, every, you know, part, every base pair in the human genome has a location. It has an index. There's some database where you can look up where it is. And if I just destroy all that information, then I don't have the human genome anymore, and we have to start all over. It's sequencing the human genome. It's a useful term, putting those base pairs in order or figuring out what order they're actually in. So we'll come back on Friday on the video lecture that I'm gonna record, and I'll, I'll pick up here, but I'm gonna cover these next couple slides. Just like we declare individual values in Java, when I declare an array, it has a type and a name, but there's a special syntax for it where I use brackets. So on line two, I declare a single value of type int called integer, 
on line four, I'm declaring an array. I'm telling Java this variable can store multiple values of this given type. And each one of them is gonna have a position. I'm putting data in order, I'm bringing order to data. Same thing down on line nine, this declares a variable called all that is, I'm telling Java, I'm gonna use this to store multiple characters. And now I can actually put text, strings, text messages, your communication, all that sort of stuff in there. Okay. When you declare an array in Java, it's empty by default. If you wanna put stuff into it, you actually have to tell Java how many values are going to be inside of it. And this is one of the limitations of arrays in Java that's a little bit unfortunate, and there's some workarounds for this. But when you use the simplest form of an array in Java, you have to tell Java when you start how many values are gonna be inside of it, and then you can't change that later. So here, for example, I'm allocating on line two, I'm declaring a variable called multiple, and I'm telling Java this is an array of integers, and I'm gonna store 18 integers in here or sorry, eight, that's over here on the right. Down at the bottom, I'm declaring an array called all, and I'm initializing it to store four characters. So again, this is one of the limitations of arrays in Java. There are ways to work around this. There are a slightly more fancy data structure that allow us to change things. Just like when I declared a single value in Java, I can initialize it, I can also initialize an array. So here's an example. I'm creating an array of type int with name multiple, and I'm initializing it with four numbers. And again, they're in order. One, two, five, and zero. Why don't I have to put a type, or sorry, why don't I have to tell Java how many values are gonna be in the array when I do this? There's no four there, why not? Because Java can figure it out, it says okay, you told me that the integers one, two, five, and 10 are gonna be in this array in that order, so I'm gonna allocate an array of size four. Okay. Let me do this, I will go through last time. Okay. So I just wanna make a brief comment about lecture participation because I know there is going to be fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and anger on the forum about this because I've calculated the lecture participation scores for last week, and they are not good. You guys are here, so I'm sort of preaching to the choir, but let me sh tell you about the things you need to do to get participation points. It is really not that hard. The first thing is, arrive on time. If you come 10 minutes late, you're not getting points for that lecture. You know, you've missed 20% of all the important information that I'm imparting. Same thing if you leave 10 minutes.